Good morning, everyone. On this third Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of joy. When Christ comes into our lives, he brings the fullness of joy. He fills our hearts with praise and gladness. When Jesus was born, the angels said that he was coming with great news of great joy for all the people. Because Christ has come to us, we can live every day in the joy of the Lord. Praise to his name. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you today as we light the candle to remind us and to represent joy. Father, let there be joy in our hearts, not because of the things we have, because of who you are. Lord, I pray that you be with us as we open your word. Speak to us and change us to be more like you so others would see you in us and come to know you. Amen. Well, I hope you're enjoying your Advent devotionals. If you haven't picked one up, I'll let you know that on the back tables are the Advent devotionals. I know that we're starting week three, but um, there's nothing like catching up um, ahead. So if you haven't picked one up, grab one. These were written by our church members for our church members. So grab one. Maybe if you're thinking, you know, now that we have some leftovers, maybe I could give one as a gift. That's great. That's a great idea. Just don't give it as a white elephant gift. Did you make me that promise as a past, as your pastor that you wouldn't give that as a white elephant gift? Watch it show up at our staff Christmas party and one of our um, presents. But grab one, grab one for a friend or neighbor, uh, pass them out, use them. If you, like you said, if not, you can play a little catch up or just hold on to it. And when halfway through the year, when you're like, you know what, we should celebrate Christ's birth more than just once a year, pull the Advent devotional out and then take some time and go through it. Also, uh, just real quickly before we dive into the message. On the back tables are these white square pieces of paper. This is for the nominations for the worship pastor search team. So if you're a church member, what we'd ask for you to do, would put your name there at the bottom and then give up to three different suggestions of people you believe in the church would serve the church well in the capacity of a worship search, uh, worship pastor search team. And then uh, the personal team is actually getting together tomorrow night to go through that and then start reaching out to those people. With that being said, Let's dive right into the message. If you have your bulletin uh, and you flip to the side where you have the, the bulletin notes and understand the first thing we're gonna talk about this is being joyful is a game changer. Being joyful is a game changer. You know what I'm talking about. You're getting ready for those holiday parties, those Christmas parties, you're getting ready to go to the office and, and you're probably having conversations like, hey, listen, that guy from purchasing, let's not sit at their table because man, he is just a drag. I mean, they always talk about how this isn't going right and this isn't going right or Maybe you're there and like, I can't wait for you to meet so-and-so there in my office. They're just so fun to be around. And, and when you're around joyful people, it's a game changer. And when you're not around joyful people, it's also a game changer. So what I did is I went, just did a simple Google search and just said, what are some things that cause people to be joyful? So I've compiled a top 10 list of things that create or are moments of joy in our life. Uh, hearing a song that you associate with your childhood. Um, I know for me, growing up, my parents made me listen to the oldies. And so still there's sometimes I'll be like at Kohl's or I'll be walking around in a, in a department store and I'll be like, you know, who do be do boop boop, you know, who wrote the book of love? I mean, I did a horrible rendition of that, but I'll hear that and I'll remember what it was like sitting in my parents' car singing these songs. My, my favorite song in the car growing up was Do Lord. You know, do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do you remember me? I loved singing that song. And I know my mom probably did not feel like the strongest Christian at times because like, mom, can we sing? And she's like, no, we're not singing. We're just gonna sit in the car and we're gonna be quiet for a while. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, but I loved to sing. I love to do those things in the car. And so when I hear those songs growing up, man, it really makes me remember those things. And it does bring some joy to our life. Here's another one. For some of you having the first sip of coffee in the morning. As a matter of fact, wow, that was a bigger amen than the first service. Wow. <laughs> I'll even go one step further. It's not the first sip of coffee. It's hearing the coffee pot go, and you hear it come on. Ours is really loud, but um, that's beside the point. You hear it come on, and some people are like, yes, it is a new day. The Lord has promised good to me. And so that first sip of coffee, some of you, that's a great thing. Here's another one. Being warm in bed when it's pouring rain outside. 
That, there's something about just snuggle up going, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's gonna be a good day. Or some of you are like, it's rainy again. But there's nice to, you know, that never happens down here in Texas, but I know. Uh, family dinners around the table. Now, I, I, for me, that's a big one. Um, not just the sitting around eating dinner at the table, but the conversations afterwards. We went out with some friends last night and I kind of felt bad for our waitress because we, we got there, we ate dinner. And then like an hour and 20 minutes later, we left our table. I'm sure it was like, she's probably thinking I could have fed two other families and gotten two more tips on this, but we just enjoyed being with one another and hanging out. And we just kind of continue to sit at the table and talk. And so for us in our, our home, that is, that's a big way uh, that j- brings joy to us. Another one would be realizing you're living the moment that you've been dreaming about for so long. Maybe you're an athletic person and you're, you know, you're, you know, playing at the next level or different things like that. You're like, I made varsity, this is what it's like. And so here I am. Maybe it was at your wedding day and you, you stood up there and you stood across from your, your, your bride or your husband to be and you looked across the crowd of all the people gathered to celebrate this moment with you and you thought, wow, this is amazing. Maybe it was uh, completing that to-do list on time. Or if you really were joyful, early. Uh, creating something with your own hands brings you joy. I know I'm not the greatest craftsman, but one of my greatest accomplishments, Abby and I, we built a catapult one time. And it wasn't because of my great engineers. I'm really good at redneckery engineering. And we got this spring and we stretched this sucker all the way through and we got it done. And this thing shooting a ping pong ball further than it needed to be. We had confidence going into that day that, you know, we would be able to launch this ping pong ball the, the right amount of distance. And creating that by ourselves with our hands, there was just great joy in that moment. Another one would be finding a photo album and looking through it with memories. Now, kids, I'm just gonna warn you, there may be a time you're looking through a photo album and you're like, who's this hot chick? You might've just pointed out your mom. So be careful, or your grandma, so be careful making comments about photo albums when you're doing that, but it's happened to me one time growing up. But sitting around and revisiting and rekindling those memories are a great thing. Here's another one, maybe taking the moment to be thankful in the present. Maybe you did that at Thanksgiving. Let's just pause right now. What is it that God has blessed us with that we are so grateful for? And talking about that and hearing those things brings joy to our life. And the number one, the number 10 thing that made my list was Ken Jones being in church today with us. So that, that's a huge thing. Uh, and by the way, no, you won't find that on the Google search. That was inserted by me. So you're not, sorry, Ken, you're not on the internet yet. But here's the thing. When life gets us down, let's not hesitate to create moments that are joyful. Let's not hesitate to say, you know what? I know this is good for me. I know this is good for my soul. I know this is good for our family to do, so we're going to do this. I know that our kids don't love, my wife and I, we love driving around looking at Christmas lights. It's not our favorite thing that our kids love to do. They're like, are we doing the Christmas light thing? They're like, you're getting, you know, you know, we're gonna go get a you know, Starbucks, we're gonna get a, you know, a, a cold brew, whatever we're gonna go do, we're gonna get a, a fancy drink and you guys will have you know, breakfast at IHOP later, so it'll be enjoyable. But my wife and I both know that One of these days we'll be not present on this earth and our kids are gonna look back at that moment and go, remember how mom and dad used to drag us around Christmas lights? We used to pretend like we hated it. We really did like it. And so don't be afraid to create these moments of joy because joy is a game changer. Now, within that, I want us to know that not as joy a game changer, but abiding in Christ is what really gives us joy. Abiding in Christ is, gives us joy. Let's look at what Jesus said in John chapter 15. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he that is bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and I will and it will be done for you. 
By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. There is a connection between having joy and abiding in Christ. I'll present it to this way in, in a, an illustration. Parents, grandparents, think back to the time when you found out that one of your kids or your grandkids came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For those kids, maybe, maybe after a VBS or, or a meeting, or they, they walked out of the bedroom and said, Mom, Dad, will you pray with me because I want to ask Jesus into my heart. Or that phone call, maybe grandma, grandpa, you get that phone call saying, hey, Nana, guess what? I'm a Christian. Jesus saved me and I'm getting baptized at this date or this place at this time. Think about that time when you got that phone call or parents, your, your kids came back and says, now that I'm a Christian, I wanna be baptized. And so when can I get baptized? When can I stand before the church to let everyone know that Jesus has saved me and that I'm a child of God and I've been made new in Christ. When, when, when can I do that? Remember those moments of when that happened. Maybe you were one of those parents who got to baptize, or a grandparent got to baptize your own kids. Think of the joy that you had in that moment. Why was it there? Because they were abiding in Christ. Now, the opposite is just as true. There's been times for us as parents, maybe with adult kids or grandparents, with our adult children, where we look back and go, you know what? Why aren't they in church right now? And it grieves us. We, you know, we were like, well, we raised them in church. We taught them the things. They were, they were in Sunday school. They, they attended RAs. They did GAs. They did all the things they were supposed to do, but they, we don't, they're just not in church right now. We don't understand where we went wrong. And there is a sadness within our heart at times. The reason why is because joy is found by abiding in Christ. So just like the times we've sat in church and we've talked with people, there's been joy in our lives because we've found them abiding in Christ. And Jesus says, I speak these things to you. Why? So that by abiding in me, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. But what are we doing about it right now? Right now, what are we doing to abide in Christ? Are we walking with him? Are we, do we get up and we spend time speaking to the Lord, listening to his voice through the word? Are we trusting him? Are we obeying him? As I said, are we listening to the word? Some of the greatest ways to understand God is to find out what he's already said and what he already has spoken. And the beautiful thing about this is we, we, we understand that by abiding in him as being a Christian and abiding in him, it's not always fun being pruned but we understand the fruit that comes from that. He says that we, he prunes so that may be, they may bear more fruit. And by abiding in him and being pruned and bearing more fruit, and we see, for lack of better words, the fruits of our labor, there's a joy that comes from that. I've been on many, many mission trips over my life. And it's funny, we always come back from a mission trip with people who just seem to be fired up with their walk with God. It's not because they went and they heard a bunch of great preaching. It's because they were actually serving. They were doing things that God has called them, that has put into practice for them to do. And so by abiding in him, there becomes this joy. So my church, my, my, my encouragement to you is if you're sitting here and there just seems to be a lull or dullness of your joy in your life, then, then get involved. Be a part, serve, those kinds of things. I had... I had uh, uh, lunch this week or breakfast, I can't remember which, with a, a, a quickly becoming friend of mine. He is a retired pastor. And he, he made the comment, he's like, he goes, uh, Paul, I've been pastor my whole life. I don't know how to really just kind of sit in church. And I just started thinking about that. I was like, well, that's because for your whole life, you know, you've been telling people don't just sit in church. And so there's, there's a point in time where he's like, hey, I need to get back involved and I need to serve and utilize my gifts. And so that's where our conversation led was how can I contribute and how can I walk in kingdom work? 
Because ultimately, it's not about a job title. It's not about a position. It's about being involved in, in, in the kingdom. And there's joy in our lives when we get to do that. And so some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, well, I just don't seem to have this joy in the Lord. I don't seem to have this excitement about what God is doing. And maybe it's because we're just coming to church. Maybe it's because we're not abiding in him. We're, we're around the things of God, but we're not involved in the things of God. So understand this. If you want things to change, joy is a game changer. The best way to have joy is to abide in Christ. And, and I, I missed this passage earlier, but I want to read it to you. Proverbs 17, 22 tells us that a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. There are many of us, we get up and we take vitamins every single day because we know the benefits of taking those things every day. We have our, our prescription medicine that the doctor gives to keep certain levels down and certain levels up. And we take that every day because we know it helps us. Proverbs tells us a joyful heart is good medicine. So church, it's a game changer, but we must abide in Christ. The other thing is this, brokenness over sin leads to strength in the Lord, leads to joy and strength in the Lord. Now, many of us have heard the, the verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength, okay? We, we've heard that many times, but for the joy of the Lord is our strength or is your strength. We've sung songs about it, but many of us don't know where that came from and what part of the Bible we look up in Nehemiah, where, what? I figured that'd be like a Proverbs or maybe a Psalms or something, but it's actually found in Nehemiah. So what I wanna do is read Nehemiah chapter eight, one through 10 to give some context on why we were able to come back and say, this is why the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah chapter eight, starting verse one, it says this, and all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of both men and women and all who could understand what they heard. On the first day of the seventh month, and he read from facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of the people who are attentive to the book of the law and Ezra, the scribe stood on a wooden uh, platform and they made for, the perp for the, made for the purpose. And beside him stood to his right, and it gives a whole bunch of names and I'm gonna save you a lot of embarrassment in my pronunciations, but these were believed to be priests. And then in, in verse five it says, and then Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people and he opened it and he stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord the great God and the people answered, amen, amen, lifting their hands and they bowed their heads and they worshiped with the Lord's faces, with the Lord, with, to the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also other men to their, to their left, um, these were Levites that helped people understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read the, from the book of the law of God clearly and they gave to the sense so that the people understood the reading. Verse nine. And Nehemiah, who was the governor and Ezra was the priest and the scribe of the Levites, taught the people and said to the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for the people wept as they heard the words of the law. When they said to them, go your way, eat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, in this moment, Nehemiah knew, prior to this, he knew the heartbreak of Jerusalem not being a fortified city. He knew it was depressing, embarrassing, and just downright dangerous as people started moving back into Jerusalem, knowing that they, had, they weren't in a fortified city. So for many years, for over 100 years, the, the walls were torn down and the doors were burned. And people started moving back and Nehemiah was given the opportunity to go and encourage and lead the Jews in rebuilding the wall. And they achieved this accomplishment in 52 days. Now we hear that and we thought, well, that's, that's amazing. But we don't realize there was a huge struggle in the process of this. 
as they began to rebuild the walls, there came a point in time where there, there was rumors that people were gonna come and attack them. And so the Bible tells us that they were building the wall with one hand and a sword in the other hand. They began to leave things by the, by the gates in case a war broke out, people would be able to defend themselves at a moment's notice. It also said that because there's a famine and things became scarce, that people were mortgaging their lands in order to buy food for their families and even gave their own children up in slavery in order to purchase food for their families. We look at this 52 days and we, we kind of gloss over the horrible things that they had to walk through and trusting God that this is what was best for us. And it was very difficult, very trying, but they were able to rebuild the walls. And when they had completed this task, they all gathered up and they opened up the law and they read it. And as they read it, instead of a Jewish custom in praying or praising God, they would look up to the heavens and look, to, look towards the heavens with their hands open as they would pray. They found themselves on their knees bowing before God with their faces to the ground. And they wept as they started reading. Basically, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had understood who God was, what he called them to do and how God had provided for them and what he had called them to be. And they had walked away from this. And that's one of the reasons they found themselves in this moment where they, when they, uh, Jerusalem was overtaken. And as the Medes and Persians took back over from Babylon, they started a chance to, to go back and move back into Jerusalem. But it was embarrassing to live in a place with unfortified walls and knowing that we'd be susceptible to attacks at any time. But this is what God has called us to do. And this is where God has called us to be. So how do we do this? And, and Nehemiah says, we're gonna build the wall. And they did it in 52 days, but it wasn't without the hard times. See, when Nehemiah stood there and they read the book of the law, they wept because they were, they, there was this confession of understanding who God was and where they were and how they had walked away from that. And that's why I say there's brokenness, brokenness over sin leads to joy and strength in the Lord. Church, I've been there, and I know some of you have too, where there's been times in our life where God has convicted us of things where we found ourselves in a situation that we knew wasn't what God had wanted us to do, and we, we had to confess and repent. And sometimes we were able to do that just through the Holy Spirit convicting us, and sometimes other people came alongside of us and said, hey, this is an area in your life you need to surrender over to the Lord. And we love you enough to tell you about this, and you need to trust him in this, and there needs to be a brokenness in there. Why? So that can lead to strength, and joy. See, the beautiful thing here is even though Jerusalem was, was overtaken and the walls were, were demolished, there was something beautiful about them coming back and rebuilding under God's leadership because no way could you reconstruct all of that in 52 days without God's hand being involved in it. And when they had done it, rather than celebrate their accomplishments, they wept and they mourned just by hearing the law and hearing the word of God taught to them. So church, where are we? Is, is, there, is there brokenness over our sin, knowing that there can be joy brought out of that? My encouragement to us today is this. Our world is falling apart, and we know that. But there's joy in abiding in who Christ is. And there's joy, this joy is good medicine for us but let us not grow weary in doing good. The king has come. He was born of a virgin. He came and lived a sinless life, became the atonement sacrifice for us so that we might be reconciled to him. And if we abide in him, our joy will be found in him. And by abiding in him, our joy is found in him and our joy is full in him because of this abidingness. So church, Joy, being joyful, is a game changer. So are we willing to make the changes necessary to be a part of that? Are we willing to abide in him? Because sometimes abiding in him also means the pruning process and going through the brokenness because out of the brokenness, we can be strengthened. So church, as we close today, I want us to be encouraged to be a people redeemed by God's blood, redeemed by, his, for, uh, by grace, 
and then go out and tell everyone that we would be that joyful person that people would want to be around. And it's not because we have a good sense of humor. It's not because we got a good series of dad jokes. It's Christ has made us whole. And we're different because of that. And our lives are full of joy. So let's close in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for a chance to be around your word, to talk about the joy that you bring by abiding in him. God, I pray that you would allow us to go out just as joy is, a joyful heart is good medicine for the soul, that, that our lives would reflect the joy that you bring. Help us abide in you and not resist the pruning process. The joy of the Lord truly is our strength. So whatever seems impossible, God, we trust you just like the Jews did as they rebuilt the wall. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. And may we pray. Church, a couple things before you leave. I know there's been a lot of announcements um, because we want you guys to be informed as possible. Um, for our church members, as I said earlier, there are these white pieces of paper on the back tables. Please, before you leave today, take time. We ended the service intentionally a little early so you wouldn't be you know, having to fight the Methodist to the restaurant too bad. But spend a couple minutes and uh, fill out, uh, put your name and up to three nominations who you believe would ser serve the church well and our worship uh, pastor selection team. As I said, our personal team's got a meeting tomorrow night, and hopefully we'll be keeping you guys uh, informed quickly with all the processes. Also, um, Brad, can, we, can I throw a wrench in your plans real quick? The slide that has the hoodies on there, can you throw that there? Because someone was like, hey, where do I get a church hoodie? And I know that's like really big business, but if you're wanting one, there's an order form. You see it on your e-bulletin. If you're not signed up on the e-bulletin, get that. But this is only open for like, I think 11 more days. So, um, so if you can grab that, there it is. So if you can scan the QR code or you can go online, it was emailed to you, but don't forget to fill this out, please, uh, before you leave. Have a wonderful week, church. Live in the joy that is found in Jesus. Have a wonderful week.